Hello everyone, my name is Carly Jensen and I am a fellow at the Civil War Institute here at Gettysburg College. Today I am joined by Dr. Timothy Orr. Dr. Orr received his PhD in Civil War History at Penn State and today he's currently an assistant professor at Old Dominion University. At the Civil War Institute Summer Conference this summer, he will be speaking about the role of sharpshooters at Gettysburg. Dr. Orr, I am so excited to hear more about your work with, about sharpshooters. Would you like to introduce yourself any further? Oh, no, uh, it was a great introduction. Thanks for having me, Carly. Awesome. So we can just jump right into our first question. Um, how did you get interested in learning about sharpshooters? Well, believe it or not, this is a story that goes back to my childhood. Uh, so when I was seven years old, my very first visit to Antietam National Battlefield, uh, which I was doing in company with a friend and his family. We were touring the battlefield and there were some Civil War reenactors on the park and they represented a sharpshooter unit in the Civil War called Burdan's Sharpshooters. And uh, they were very nice to me and my friend. We were both seven-year-old kids, very eager to wrap our fingers around their, their rifles and everything. So, uh, uh, they they let us kind of you know introduced us to the equipment that they had put on some of the gear and from that moment on i was i was hooked onto the idea that there was this special unit out in the union army that did long range shooting and it, at first it started as just sort of an, a, a childhood obsession right uh, me and my father would research the sharpshooters we eventually became civil reenactors ourselves uh, but uh, when I moved on to academia, the sort of love of studying Union sharpshooters stayed with me. And eventually I did a few essays on the subject, you know, kind of exploring them more um, systematically. And uh, it's been sort of a maybe an early childhood obsession of the Civil War that has kind of shaped my view of military history in general. That's so awesome. I mean, I got into the Civil War when I was younger, too. So it's so cool to see how our passions when we're younger can translate into our passions um, when we're older and in academia. That's awesome. Yeah, um, my next good to have parents and, you know, figures in our lives who, when we're young, introduce us to history, because I don't think yes. that we, we get an appreciation for it as strongly if we're not introduced to it at a very early and receptive age. Definitely, I agree. I definitely thank my parents every day for dragging me to battlefields when I was younger. Um, awesome. My next question is about sharpshooting units themselves. Were there any variances in the sharpshooting units um, throughout the army? Were there different trainings? Um, were men found in conditions where they were un uh, unexpectedly sharpshooters in the middle of a battlefield? Um, can you speak more on that? Yeah, sure. So. Anyone in modern times who would be looking back on sharpshooting of the Civil War era would find it terribly uh, anachronistic, right? Like very um, almost medieval in a way, right? Because the, the, the type of training that Civil War soldiers went through was not near as sophisticated as it is for modern day snipers today. Uh, right. But there were variations on the type of training they received. So the particular units that I like to explore, the, the two elite sharpshooter units in the Army of the Potomac, the first and second U.S. sharpshooters, which were commonly called Burdan sharpshooters, had to go through a shooting test in order to join the regiment. So every soldier, in order to become a member, had to be able to shoot 10 consecutive shots into a target that was 10 inches in diameter at a range of 200 yards, right? And that's with an open-sighted weapon. And 200 yards is, to put in some perspective, it's like two football fields stacked end to end. It's very hard to even see across such a distance as such a small target, uh, let alone hit anything like that with a black powder weapon. But uh, lo and behold, there were at least 2,000 men uh, from the North who were able to meet those qualifications and join Bernan's elite regiment. Now, in other sharpshooter regiments across the Civil War, particularly in Confederate units, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of testing that was done to put soldiers into sharpshooter units, but they were selected by their officers for that purpose after having seen them perform in battle. So very famously, 
1863, there is an act passed by the Confederate Congress called the Sharpshooter Act. And it is an effort to form Confederate sharpshooter battalions. And the first sharpshooter battalions are created in the spring of 1863. And by the summer of 1864, nearly every brigade in the Army of Northern Virginia has a sharpshooter battalion attached to it. And these battalions are mostly made up of picked men from each regiment. So if you have a brigade of, say, five regiments, every regiment will contribute about 20 men to the sharpshooter battalion. You form like a 100-man battalion. And initially, these men are selected because oftentimes they are the worst men in their regiments. Because like, if you are a regimental commander, you might want to get rid of, like, say, 20 men who just annoy you, right, that are the troublemakers. And so initially, these Confederate sharpshooter battalions are very poorly disciplined. But as time goes on, and sharpshooting becomes more of a I don't know, a profession, more of a mainstay of how the armies fight, uh, more often these men are better selected, uh, selected for their prowess. And they undergo some kinds of training. Uh, there was one kind of training procedure the Confederates undertook with its sharpshooter battalions where they would have like a potential member who was going to join up. He'd be out in the middle of a field with an officer. And then another man would be some distance away. He'd pop up really quickly and then hop back down. And then the potential recruit had to identify where that man was through his peripheral vision and tell the officer how far away he was, right? So if they could, they could do that, if they could quickly judge a person's distance and direction in just a few seconds, then they would make like a qualified sharpshooter. Because that's basically what sharpshooting was, the kind of cat and mouse game of popping up, firing, and then getting under cover before a volley of bullets came your way. That just sounds like the most stressful job to me, trying to shoot accurately and hide from the enemy. That's just incredible. Um, would you say that their skill um, to do those ac activities, like jump up into the trees and jump back down, is that what made them so deadly or were there other factors? Yeah, well, I would say their, their deadliness was of course just with their experience with marksmanship, right? And uh, for many of them, the Civil War was fought in such a way that it allowed them to get better, uh, particularly like later on in the war. More often, armies are digging in and entrenching. And so rather than have battles where they join and then pull apart, they're kind of locked into combat with each other. And there's continual desultory firing between the lines. And this gives sharpshooters more opportunity to ply their trade, right? And then more opportunities to hone their skill. So if you study like the later campaigns of the Civil War, the Petersburg campaign, the Overland campaign in the Eastern Theater, and then the Atlanta campaign in the Western Theater. These are campaigns that are marked by sharpshooter activity between like the major battles. So I would say the war itself provides that opportunity. Uh, but the other kind of big thing about what the sharpshooters are like is that it's kind of a new thing in many ways. You know, though the U.S. Army had used rifle regiments prior to uh, sharpshooter introduction in the Civil War, in the War of 1812 and the Revolutionary War. You know, these were generally just things that were done by the militia units. And there were very few kind of regular trained sharpshooter units until the Civil War came around and the Union and Confederate armies created them. So in some ways, it was kind of a new profession, a new branch of the military. And you know, they weren't, they weren't always well received by, by soldiers on both sides because they couldn't, they saw a fine line between killing a man in battle and then killing a man in skirmish order when it's kind of viewed as dishonorable to kill a man that way and more like murder rather than combat. So my roundabout conclusion to this is that sometimes when we talk about sharpshooters during the Civil War, there's a lot of mythology that goes on with them, and their deadliness is exaggerated because of the, uh, of the, the, the horrible um, things that are attached to the idea of sharpshooters when the war begins, right? So it's a little bit difficult to pull out the reality from the mythology of sharpshooters because of the kind of negative propaganda that is attached to them.
Yeah, that definitely makes sense. And that's a great way to explain it. Thank you. Um, how were the sharpshooters using the landscape of the battlefield and how were the ways they were utilizing it similar or different to other soldiers? Yeah, great question. So most sharpshooters would fight in what's called skirmish order. And if you're familiar with Civil War tactics, most infantry units will go in in a close order formation called line of battle, where the men are shoulder to shoulder, two ranks, and each rank is like right on top of each other, the rear rank being about a forearm's length behind the front rank. Uh, sharpshooters generally fight in skirmish formations. Uh, that is, they disperse into a single rank, and each soldier is about five or ten paces apart from his nearest file partner. And that way, okay. it allows the sharpshooters to use cover and concealment much better than regular line infantry. Uh, and further, especially in the Union, Civil War sharpshooters are equipped with breech-loading weapons. And this is kind of a significant thing. Uh, in addition to giving them a chance to load and fire quickly, uh, let's say more quickly than a muzzle-loading weapon, uh, Breach loading weapons allow a soldier the opportunity to reload while lying down. Uh, you can you can reload with a muzzle loading weapon on your back, but it's very hard to do. Uh, but with a breach loading weapon, it's very easy. And this allows the soldier to remain concealed behind like a rock or a tree, and then again take aim at their target and bring it down. So uh, there's sort of the the interface of the technology, the tactics. And they kind of define how the sharpshooters use the terrain to their advantage. And so most of the time, you would see sharpshooters at the beginning of an engagement or at the end of an engagement, right? As they're the, the first wave of, of soldiers that go out to make contact with the enemy. And then as the, the lines pull apart after the end of an engagement, they're often sent out to kind of, again, establish a position and make sure the enemy doesn't pursue or get around your flank. Uh, so sharpshooters, they get the most of their work at the opening moments of an engagement or at the end of it. Wow, that's really interesting. I thought they were kind of dispersed throughout the battle, but that's really interesting. Thank you. My final question kind of ties into what we were speaking about earlier about the perceptions of sharpshooters, um, especially during the war. Um, can you talk a little bit about how they were perceived a little, a little bit more about how they perceived culturally and militarily during the war and even today? How are they remembered? Yeah, great question. Uh, and this is one of the things I'm, I'm most fascinated about. One of the, the essays that I wrote several years ago is about the introduction of Berdan's first U.S. sharpshooters on the peninsula and how they were received by the press, by the uh, their fellow Union soldiers, and by the Confederates who opposed them. And, and all these, these different elements had different opinions about them, right? I would say in general, when they are first introduced, uh, they are not welcomed, uh, particularly by other Union soldiers. Uh, they, they viewed a lot of the Union sharpshooters as, I don't know, braggarts, uh, as people who were boasting of having killed the enemy and having no proof that they had done so. Uh, and there's, uh, and probably at worst, they would just call them outright murderers who would trick the enemy into getting killed. There's a very illustrative story that comes from a Union captain named Donaldson, who was on the Peninsula campaign. He describes a moment where he sees four members of the Berdan sharpshooters come walking along the Union line, kind of along the Warwick River, uh, and they they kind of set up. Uh, and these sharpshooters had target rifles with them, kind of telescopic sighted weapons. They could see pretty great distance. And after they set up these their telescope rifles, they they wait and they see four Confederate soldiers come marching through the woods, you know, great distance away. And what the sharpshooters did is that one of them put his rifle down and picked up his field glasses, his, his binoculars, right? Held up his hand and the other three took aim. And when he dropped his hand, they all fired at the same time. So they killed three of the four Confederates. And they left the fourth Confederate alive because what he ended up doing was calling for help. And then four more Confederates showed up and the sharpshooters killed these men too. And the Confederates who were across the way, they were, they were so furious at being tricked this way. They, just, they sent a volley of kind of unaimed rifle fire and it hit Donaldson's regiment, the Pennsylvanian who was describing this. And he was just, he was not 
happy with what the sharpshooters had done. He called them spiders who were out looking for some dumb flies, right? So he told the sharpshooters to go elsewhere. So initially, the sharpshooters don't get a whole lot of um, positive appraisal from their fellow Union soldiers. But as the war goes on, they become a more recognized and useful unit. Uh, you know, famously, at the Battle of Chancellorsville, Ferdinand's sharpshooters capture a whole regiment of Georgia soldiers, 23rd Georgia, uh, bagging the, the whole of the, the unit. Uh, and at Gettysburg, they play kind of an important role in protecting the Union left flank and kind of helping to slow the Confederate advance towards Little Round Top. And the events like these slowly ingratiate themselves to the rest of the Union Army. Uh, in the Confederacy, the Verdan sharpshooters are recognized as a useful unit, so the Confederates start creating their own sharpshooter battalions in response. As I mentioned to you a few minutes ago, even the Confederate Congress gets in on the action by passing a law that requires them to do this. And finally, uh, Union newspapers really start to play up the role of these Verdan sharpshooters, particularly early in the war, when there's not much I don't know, successful military action on the part of the Army of the Potomac. You know, as many Civil War buffs know, the Union Army of the Potomac is stuck on the peninsula for a long amount of time, right? Because it's very slow-moving commander, George McClellan, moves up cautiously. But one of the big stories that comes out of the peninsula is the success of Burdan's sharpshooters. They're the ones who are doing all this killing, and the newspapers really play up that story. In fact, uh, they're played up so much that there is a famous illustrator named Winslow Homer who makes one of his, his big wartime debut illustrations about the Burdans. And he draws a famous, initially a sketch and it's turned into a watercolor uh, just called the Union Sharpshooter and depicts a sharpshooter with a telescopic rifle in a tree, right? It's kind of a very fanciful illustration yeah. But it really captured the imagination of what sharpshooters could do. So I would say the Civil War is a place where the sharpshooters earn their role among armies. And then in the 1880s, uh, sharpshooting becomes sort of a staple of army training and indoctrination, that you start to actually train soldiers in long-range shooting, even giving out awards for the best marksmen. And as we know today, Sharpshooting is an important feature of special forces training, right? That uh, a right. lot of the Navy SEAL units and Army Rangers that have to go in and do very high risk clandestine <clears throat> operations, they need to have a sniper on their team in order to get the job done. So I would say the Civil War is the story of U.S. special forces in its So um, mixed, mixed opinions when, when it starts, but by 2022 permanently accepted. Yeah, just a follow-up question. Um, you were talking about how the Union soldiers didn't really like the idea of the sharpshooters at the beginning. Was the mm. same true with the Confederate sharpshooters? I know you mentioned earlier that these were usually men that weren't very well liked. Was, mm -hmm. Did that just like um, carry over to their role as sharpshooters? Yeah, I... You know, from the Confederate perspective, at least in the Eastern theater, because they don't develop sharpshooting battalions first. They're sort of the yeah. second army to do it. Their initial impression of the Burdan sharpshooters is that they are, you know, these, these kind of very, very cruel murderers, right? But right. then when they're forced into making their own sharpshooter battalions, they seem to be welcomed very heartily. And the the Confederate divisional commander, who I think is most responsible for that, is a guy named Robert Rhodes. Um, the name may kind of resonate among Gettysburg enthusiasts because he's a divisional commander with the Army of Northern Virginia, fights up on the first day. Rhodes is really the kind of the pioneer of making these sharpshire battalions. He's the first one to kind of put them together in the Army of Northern Virginia. Uh, he has a very successful battalion called Blackford's Sharpshooters that fights on the first right. day. And um, as a result, the Confederates really, they have maybe less trouble uh, embracing the creation of the sharpshooter units. They don't see them as, as these braggadocious um, media hounds like they are perceived in the Northern Army. But, uh, and I think maybe that part of that is there's maybe some cultural or regional explanations for it that hunting is a more common thing in the Southern states prior to the war. It's yeah. more likely that 
Confederates will kind of use guns day to day. Uh, and as a result, uh, I, don't, I don't think long range shooting is seen as something that is, I don't know, unethical or um, improper to be used in the Civil War. Uh, and so once the Confederates start doing charger battalions, it's kind of a, just a, uh, a common occurrence, right? It's something that is an everyday routine procedure for the Army in Northern Virginia. That's just fascinating, the differences between them and the way they, their legacy has kind of evolved over time. That's really, really interesting. Well, those are all my questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Orr, for taking the time to speak with me and answer those questions. Um, make sure to join Dr. Orr's walking tours this summer at the conference. You will not wanna miss them. They will be a treat for sure. Um, Dr. Orr, thank you again, and we look forward to seeing you this summer. Absolutely. I will see you all on the battlefield.